Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, I have an interesting one for you. So we have Kevin Mulrain, who's currently VP of Mid-Market Sales at Global Web Index. Now, I mean, according to Kevin's LinkedIn profile, we don't have any direct sales operations experience. So I have spoken with Kevin before, and he obviously has, as part of his sales leadership and management roles, been exposed and been responsible for sales operations. And this may be a trend you see as we move forward with the podcast, is that we're going to also incorporate uh, sales leaders into these interviews. So Kevin, welcome to the show. Awesome, man. No, this is great. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me on. So First, I want to understand your, your exposure to sales ops, if that's okay, because um, as I said, according to LinkedIn, we had these uh, what all sales experience from individual contributor up to like, VP and leadership. Um, where have you been exposed to sales operations? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, for me, you know, I, uh, a lot of my background work is working within you know, high growth startups. Um, and for anyone who's been exposed to that kind of a world, you wear every single hat possible and imaginable. Um, and so for me, um, that's really kind of how I got more exposed into sales operations. So I was, I was working at a company um, and it really was like come in and, and understand and define our process, understand what's working, understand what's not working, um, but really start to be able to actually, uh, you know, define a process, measure and, and optimize for growth. And so, you know, more, more so I was finding myself getting involved operationally um, we did an entire overhaul of Salesforce, our CRM, um, and I was really the person quarterbacking, you know, that particular project. So really getting into you know, the weeds of, of Salesforce and then also understanding sales process and really how those two things kind of tied together. Um, you know, I was I was a sales manager at the time, but, you know, I, no one else was really raising their hand to do it. So I was like, hey, why not? Let's make it happen. So, um, yeah, I was kind of thrown into it, but I think very very much organically. It's, um, it's the way I, I think it's the way I operate. So it, it, it kind of took off, uh, like I said, pretty organically. And so which, when you did this Salesforce overhaul, when you were the manager and then you got thrown into being responsible, which business was this? So this was when I was at uh, Madison Logic. Got it. Okay. And was that your first like real taste of kind of the operation stuff? Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think, you know, when it came to operations on a, on a wider scale, so as an individual contributor, I was always very process driven. I was always very much trying to understand my math of sales and, and really understand my conversions. So I think that's kind of where, where it really started or where that you know, seed was planted. Um, but really doing it at a wider scale for an entire org, it, it really kicked off at Madison Logic. Got it. Awesome. And then if we fast forward to today, I assume Global Web Index has their own sales operations team, or am I assuming wrong? Um, we have a sales operations person. Okay, cool. Sales ops person. Um, and roughly how many people are in the sales function? Um, so globally, I'd say uh, across account executives and sales development, it's probably about 40 or so um, individual contributing sales reps. Uh, and then on the account management side, there's probably another you know, 15 to 20. Got it, 15, 20. And then we have the one ops person. And then in terms of the leadership, so your VP of mid-market, are there other, is there another VP or two other VPs for different segments? Yeah, so we have VPs um, on the enterprise part of our business um, and then also um, heads of sales for vertical specialization. So we sell to agencies, brand direct, uh, and also media companies. Got it. Awesome. And so this one sales person, are they reporting into you or are they reporting into a different VP? Um, so uh, they used to. Currently, they, they uh, report into our chief commercial officer. Cool. And the, and the CCO is like all, all of the sales VPs reporting to the CCO? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So the sales person, just writing notes of the, the VPs. Okay, cool. And then the current uh, tech stack at Global Web Index. Yeah, so um, we're using Salesforce as our CRM. Um, We're also using SalesLoft as an enablement tool. Um, On top of that, we're using Zoom Info, um, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Um, It's it's pretty lean right now, um, but we still find that there's a tremendous opportunity to kind of even optimize with with what we've got. Got it. Yeah, that is pretty lean. Um, How have you seen... So... 
How do you view the relationship between sales leadership and sales operations? I know it's a very broad question. No, it's a, honestly, I think it's a great question um, because I think very much historically they've been very, very siloed um, where I actually think that there, there needs to be either closer alignment or um, even, you know, I, I think what we're going to see over the next couple of years is our, you know, heads of sales are going to be somebody that can wear both hats um, because of the importance of sales operations. Um, because I think really what it's doing is it's, it's blending this art and a science, right? The sales operations sides of things, it's really understanding your process. It's understanding what's happening. It's understanding the, the results that, that those actions are driving. Um, it's maximizing um, efficiencies, both from a process perspective, but also um, within leveraging technology and tools and how all these things integrate. So um, as, as a sales leader, that's really, I think, what's been super foundational to, to just my success is having that understanding. And then for me, it's really being able to kind of point, you know, across our process or through our funnel and saying, okay, this is, you know, we're kind of falling off a cliff at, at this conversion point. Let's try to understand why, what types of trainings can we implement? So um, I think that they really need to be almost one and the same, um, but I think the more aligned, um, the better. Got it. Blending the art and the science. Okay, cool. So can you share a time where, when you have been able to make either a rep or a group of reps more productive? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... You know, there's there's a couple different instances and there's a couple different ways, but I think one of the, you know, one of the most foundational things is just really allowing reps to understand their math of sales, right? Um, a lot of the times, I find their reps come in, they don't really have a plan. Um, they're just kind of I don't want to say they're going through the motions, but they're very reactive to their days. They're not um, really planning out their quarter, their month, their week, their days, and so. Um, where I think I've, I've been able to have a positive impact there is really being able to work on that planning with them um, and break down, you know, more consumable, more digestible types of approaches to their plan, making sure they've got a plan B. But more importantly, looking at that process and looking at the activity and seeing what type of results it's driving. So if we know that if we can increase um, and it may be activity, right, but if we can increase the conversion point by 2 percent, what kind of an impact does that have? on your, you know, yearly achievement to your quota. So really going over, uh, you know, kind of like a, a math of sales calculator and saying, you know, managing out and just looking at what's the pipeline we need to be driving on a monthly basis and how is that going to help us get to our numbers, you know, based on whatever the sales cycle may be. Um, so it, it's really getting into like just simplifying the, the key benchmarks that need to be achieved in order to see a certain result. So I think that has helped reps get better visibility and transparency in terms of what needs to happen on, on a, a day-to-day level. Got it. And I think this is similar to what other, other people have said about give, making the sales rep like the CEO of their own business, uh, like yeah. having them understand and be responsible for their own numbers. Yeah. So, and, and like, that's like a big, that's definitely a big part of it. And one of the things that, you know, we've been, um, really working on over the last few months and, and really seeing a positive impact this year specifically is um, reps taking more accountability and more ownership on creating their plan on, you know, with the reps one-on-ones, it's not to sit down and ask, ask questions about their pipeline and their deal strategy and closing plans. It's them bringing that to the table. So they're preparing the one-on-ones, right? They're preparing the agenda, they're owning their metrics, they're owning their conversions and, um, that as well, we've seen not only um, an impact on on efficiencies, but I think overall, um, it's just giving much closer alignment between rep and management on what needs to happen to see a certain result. Got it. So when you say agenda, then the rep is responsible for bringing their own agenda to their like weekly sales meeting with you. Exactly. Yeah, they need to take ownership on compiling you know, the accounts they want to be speaking about, the, the closing plans on those, pipeline information, everything. Got it. Um, have you ever had to try and make a rep do something that maybe he doesn't want to do because it's not within a skill set or directly related to him to getting commission? And if so, how did you, how did you do that? Oof. Um, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the most 
one of the most important things or the most important jobs of, of anyone in management or sales leadership is to ensure your reps are focused on things that drive to a commission, right? Um, there are always going to be things that, you know, that um, reps may do that fall a little bit outside of that. But um, in my opinion, it really, you know, 80, 90% of their time and focus should be solely on what has to happen in order to, you know, hit numbers or overachieve numbers or hit their personal goals, goals and their, their growth. So um, I, I don't want to say I try and steer, I, I don't, I don't really try and push them to do too much outside of trying to hit, hit their own numbers to be really candid with you. Um, however, there are, there are instances where I may ask somebody to, you know, deliver a training or to, you know, talk through a deal that they, they closed. Um, and I, I don't, it doesn't really take a lot of convincing someone to do those types of things because I think, you know, with our hiring process, like we're just trying, we're, we're we hire people that we know are going to be good team players that we know are going to be super collaborative. It's, it's really embedded in our culture. So I don't think that, you know, because of that, I don't think we have too much. Um, there's not a lot of an effort in trying to convince people to do things that they don't want to do. Got it. And this is super interesting, like the difference between sales ops and sales leadership, right? Because I probably asked that question like 50 times and most like hardcore sales ops people are like, yeah, it's so tough having to get the sales people to do the stuff that we need them to do. Um, uh, yep. So it's quite interesting that as a, a more leadership focused sales uh, manager slash leader, um, is kind of relying on hiring to ensure you have team players, but then having them focus almost the majority of their time on on hitting their own quota. And, and I and I think to that point, right? It's a really interesting point because you, you look at you know you look at so many different organizations, and every single company I've ever spoken where I've worked for, they're always like, our Salesforce instance is a mess, right? And everyone's is a mess, and and a lot of it is because of data quality, and a lot of it is because you know reps aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, a, we've sort of overcome that or we've minimized that based on, again, that, that, that one-to-one strategy where the reps are, are taking accountability and ownership, but more ex- importantly, explaining why, right? Like why, why is it important for them to have an updated, uh, an accurate pipeline? Why is it important for them to understand every single step that they're doing within Salesforce? Why is that important? I think one of the, kind of unique vantage points or, or, you know, I, when I look at a sales process, I look at it through the lens of a sales professional, of a sales rep, right? So I can understand like the day to day, the steps of what they're actually doing. Um, so when I design these things, I know not to make it too arduous and not to over-engineer it where you're not going to get that adoption and you're not going to get the uh, data integrity that you need. On the flip side though, because of the kind of operational minds that I have, I still know how to design it where we're still going to capture the things that we need to capture. So there, there is that super fine balance of over-engineering it so you can capture every little detail and everything you need and then not making it you know, too over-engineered where people are going to look at it and be like, I'm going to be spending my entire life in Salesforce. No way. So it's absolutely a balance, but I think the most important thing is teaching the reps and explaining them why it's important and how they can actually leverage Salesforce or the data to their advantage to sell more. Got it. Awesome. Moving on to the sales forecasting process. How's that currently working? Um, that's a really good question. It's a very topical question for our org. Um, you know, our, our forecasting approach, um, you know, at least for, for my team, you know, we, we really do run through specific key questions and things that the reps do need to be able to answer in order for us to um, input something into our forecast. So, um, you know, right now, like we're, we're very much diving into every single opportunity. We're looking at pipeline. We're looking at specific behaviors. We're also looking at the velocity of email replies and phone calls, right? Because that's a huge indicator for us in terms of the timeliness of something's going to close. You know, so we, you know, we kind of have a really good process and system. I'm saying, all right, these are things that we need to be able to answer and identify before we can put something into the forecast. Um, and, you know, to an extent, we've been a little conservative with it, but that's allowed us to be a lot more accurate on the forecasting aspect um, that, you know, again, it's just, it's leading to not just more accurate forecasts, but also giving better direction to our, our sales reps as well. Awesome. So you're basically saying that 
in order for a rep to add something to the forecast, they have to have done X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different sort of sales processes or methodologies you can look at. There's like medic, med pick, all that sort of stuff. But we've really sort of identified a series of questions that, you know, we need to make sure we have really firm answers to and different um, kind of verifiables from our prospects that um, we're going to question the the sales reps with. And, um, you know, there's certain things that we're going to need to understand, like procurement process, for instance, that's something that's always starting throwing people off. And it's something that we try to address earlier on in our, our sales process to help expedite that. But um, yeah, really just understanding, you know, what are the verifiables that customers have to kind of give us in order to put that into the forecast. And we, we also really just, we try and focus on winning what's winnable, right? And, and, and that kind of condenses um, or prioritizes our pipeline and really focusing on the winnable deals out there and trying to remove a lot of the noise. Got it. Winning what is winnable. Um, Okay, cool. And then if I said to you, if you could only measure one sales metric for the rest of your life, what would you choose? That is a crazy question. Um, One sales metric for the rest of my life. Um, I think it would be, (laughs) this might be kind of a, kind of a workaround to your, your question, but I, I, I think pipeline velocity is something I'd measure. Now it is sort of a combination of formula of different metrics. So it's not necessarily just one thing. Um, but I think really what it would be for me is just looking at, um, you know, really the speed at which we get something into the pipeline and how effectively we can move it to close. That to me is a, um, uh, you know, a, a scalable um, metric when it comes to indicating quality of pipeline and the ability to close. Um, so that's one. And I think if I had to give you a second one, cause that's, like I said, it's kind of a combination of different metrics. Um, customer acquisition cost to me is, is probably one of the, the core metrics to, to, you know, from a business perspective to really validate the efficiency of your team. It's a great indicator um, of when to scale, when to hire, um, so to me, if you're looking at really like more of like the health of your business, um, that would probably be the, the key metric for me. When you're measuring customer acquisition cost with sales teams, do you like look at how much time a rep has spent on a deal and then factor in their salary? Like how does that process work? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So we're pretty much looking at um, not so much their the time spent on deals, um, but looking at you know their their salary, their overhead, um, commission costs. Of course, uh, we look at our marketing costs. So you know, any any and again, there's uh, management costs obviously built into that, um, sales development costs built into that. So um, as, as best we can, just to get a holistic picture of you know when we close a deal, essentially how much money do we make off every single deal? And it's a great indicator for us is just to see how well our our reps are ramping. So from a timing perspective, we, we try and shoot to get our, our sales reps within a certain, you know, CAC within a certain timeframe. Got it. So it's a metric you've to like all the deals came through, here's all we spent on getting the deals and then you can work out per deal, how much we spent. Um, Cool. Awesome. And then final question, who has taught you the most about sales up slash sales leadership? Um, that's a great question because I think the, the exciting thing about the world we live in today is like, there's just so much exposure to super smart people, amazing content, all of that. Um, like I said, kind of like my sales ops background, it's been a lot of just like diving in and figuring things out. Um, which has worked out kind of well for me in a way. Um, but I think if I was, if I was going to kind of highlight one person I, that I've just learned a lot from, um, Peter Kazanji, who he's the CEO of Atrium. Um, he also runs Modern Sales Professionals, um, which is a group of uh, network of salespeople that pretty much just like they put on events, they talk shop. Um, he has a, a super strong operational background, but he's got product marketing background, entrepreneurial background. Um, he's just... Um, a lot of different skill sets there, but I think I, I mentioned him just because I, I've learned a lot being a part of the modern sales pros group. Um, I've learned a lot from his content. Um, you know, so I think just the, the impact he's had on, 
on the profession as a whole has been um, super valued. But I know for me, um, it's always a go-to resource for me. So um, that that's probably the the biggest area of, of learning for me. Got it. Shout out to Peter and Modern Sales Pros. Um, okay, awesome. So here here are the things that I that I picked out. Um, I I think you you might be forecasting a big trend here in that well, we used to have like sales leadership, sales ops, but actually to be an effective ops person or leader person, you need characteristics from both areas, like the art and the science, as you said. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the productivity or the ultimate like productivity hack for sales is actually getting them to understand and manage their own time and numbers. Um, and then, yeah, uh, and then when you do that, you can ensure the reps are focused more on their just commission-based activities. And then if you have to do anything like outside of that, you resolve that by hiring people that you know are going to be team players and so are happy to go and do the training session, um, et cetera. Um, so yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for your insights and thank you for coming on. Yeah, man, this was great. I appreciate it.